gather on this 13th Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost here at St. James House of Prayer, Tampa, Florida, welcoming those online. And uh, I am very glad to be back. And I had a very good time away, so thank you. And, uh, and I, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Exodus. Now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all of the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy, boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at the distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her attendants walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will sing the refrain, our help is in the name of the Lord after every two verses of Psalm 124.
If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, If the Lord had not been on our side, when enemies rose up against us. Then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger towards us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent gone over us. Then would the raging waters have gone right over us. Blessed be the Lord, he has not given us over to be prey for their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The second reading is from Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transferred by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, not all members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering the, teach, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, it's good to be back and be with, with you. I was uh, all the way out in, um, well, let's see, I was in Pittsburgh last Sunday, and I managed to tune you all in for a while before I had to leave and go to church with my sister. But it was fun to uh, be able to be here and I'm grateful that um, the Reverend Martha Wagner was able to be with you those two weeks. Today we hear of Jesus at Caesarea Philippi and there's the confession of, of, of Peter here proclaiming him as, as seeing him now as the Messiah the son of the living God, and inviting us inherently into a full faithfulness in our response to him. And in the epistle to the Romans, the particularity of response that each one of us has. We're all different, we're all called to serve God and respond to God in different ways. And with those things in mind, I want us to turn all the way back to this lesson from Exodus, which is so telling in so many ways about faithfulness and response to adversity. Because it begins by telling this story of the people of Israel in Egypt. They had been there for a good long time and they had had that experience where Joseph had found himself in Egypt, had found himself through interpretation of dreams, coming into the king's favor, and then he became the ruler under the king for, the, uh, for Egypt and presided over that time of feast, which was followed by the time of famine and he had predicted this and they had prepared for it and they were able to sustain all of Egypt during those years of famine and they were able to sustain their neighbors as well. And so the Israelites had come and lived in Egypt during this time of famine and had stayed on in, that, in the years that followed and now when we pick up the story, things were not going well. It says, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. In other words, all that gratitude and all that working together and all that cooperation was now out the window. And they were going to start having 
a level of conflict that had not been there until it had grown into it. So the king said to the people, essentially, let's blame the Israelites for all our troubles. It says, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Ooh, fear of the foreigner. Here we go. This stuff, by the way, gets very familiar and close to home. I just want to point that out. They're more numerous, more powerful than me. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, and they, in, they will increase. You see, because if we don't deal shrewdly with them, they will increase, and in the event of war, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Division, thus them. And get this one, they'll escape from the land. Well, I think in the early days it was a good thing they were there, but it seems as though they had fallen into some level of oppression because they were, the Egyptians were now afraid, not only afraid of the Israelites, they were also afraid that they might leave. And you go, Ooh, what is this? Sounds like a little economic dependency going on here. That maybe those Israelites were doing the jobs that the uh, Egyptians didn't want to do. Sounds real familiar. Anyhow. So they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And here we go. There's the economic prosperity. They built supply cities. Pitam and Ramses for Pharaoh. But oddly enough, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. It sounds complex, it sounds interwoven, it sounds economic, it sounds historical, it sounds like, I think we've got a modern word for it, systemic racism. Many people deny that that exists in our country, by the way. I'm not telling anybody anything here. <laughs> but you see how it gets baked into the way the whole thing's put together. There's an interdependency which fuels the racist positions. And so, here, there was this racism, Egyptian against Israelite, and fear that they might leave. It's like, what do you do with that? So there it is. But then, what does God do about these sorts of things? And this is where the sacred history of the people of Israel begins to show through this, that God, God's way of making things right is, is very, um, well, it's like only God could think of this. Let's put it that way. So the king of Egypt was still anxious and uptight and upset, so he tells the midwives he has his solution. He's going to get the midwives when they attend a birth of one of the Hebrew women when she gets ready to give birth, if it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, let it live. Midwives were not at all comfortable with this. And they were God-fearing themselves, as it says here in the lesson. So they simply disobeyed Pharaoh. That's all there was to it. They just said, we're not going to do what he wants. And he figures it out, calls them in, calls them on the carpet, and says, why are you doing this? And they come up with the greatest excuse of all. They said, oh, these are not weak women. You know, these, <laughs> these Israelites, they're not like the Egyptian women. They are strong, they are vigorous, and by the time we show up, they're already back out working. I mean, <laughs> they've given birth and they don't blink an eye. And he goes, hmm. Huh. But see, it's based on 
civil disobedience, would we call it civil disobedience? By simply not going along with what was wrong. They just weren't going to do it. So they didn't. And then they begin to tell the story of Moses. How this man married a woman, a Levi went, married a Levite woman. She conceived, she bore a son and saw it was a fine baby and says, I'm not letting anybody take this one away from me. Because, you know, he, Pharaoh said his command went to all the people, not just the midwives, that every boy born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile. You see one around, toss it in the Nile. But every girl you let live. So here she's hiding her baby. And when she just can't figure it out anymore, she does something which is pretty odd, pretty strange. And when we look back at this from another point of view in a minute, it may make sense. But it says when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, plastered it up with bitumen and pitch, in other words, made it into a little waterproof boat, sort of like Noah's Ark. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds right on the edge of the river. And Moses' sister stood at a distance to see what was going to happen. Now, wait a minute. This all sounds like a plot and a plan, doesn't it? You know, how, how is it that in order to hide her child, she would put him in a basket by the side of the river, and then uh, we have his own sisters standing by, watching out to see what would happen. And then it just happens they put him in the river where Pharaoh's daughter would come to bathe. And so while she was bathing in the river, her attendants walked beside the river. Her attendants were very likely um, young Israelite women, <laughs> probably friends of Moses' um, sister. Moses' sister might have even been one of the attendants, but I have no doubt they all knew each other walk beside the river that they saw the basket among the reeds and Pharaoh's daughter sees the basket among the reeds and asks the maid to bring it and she goes oh a child this must be one of the Hebrews children and then his sister somehow is able to talk to Pharaoh's daughter this is Moses' sister now older sister had seen what was going on comes up to Pharaoh's daughter and says Oh, shall I go get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Oh, what a fine idea. So she goes and gets her mom. She goes and gets Moses' mother, who had nursed him that morning, and gets him and takes Moses back, now under the protection of Pharaoh's daughter. See, now it's all an official arrangement. And she nurses that child. And when the child grew up, and I don't know whether, whether it's when he was weaned or whether he was out of high school or, you know, quite what happens here. But anyhow, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. She took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. There's a whole tradition in, in Jewish uh, uh, biblical interpretation called the Midrash, which is the, the backstory of all the scripture. And there's a whole lot of Midrash on this whole passage, which supports the idea that this was really a plot laid out in advance among all the women, and that they knew what was going on beginning to end and Pharaoh's daughter wanted to have a little kid. The easiest way for her to get a little kid, I mean, it was all worked out in advance. And so here it is, Moses was going to be taken care of. And being of Hebrew, Israelite origin, and 
upbringing up to a point, at the same time being brought up in the household of Pharaoh, and who else would be ultimately, I mean, he had his ups and downs, but ultimately would be more prepared to lead the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, where there was systemic racism going on, there was a form of slavery had grown up and eventually enslaved them in Egypt, and the Egyptians at the same time did not want to let them go. And Moses came in and said, let my people go. Let my people go and let it be according to God's will and God's way. And everybody had their own individual part to play in doing this work of God. Everybody had their part to play in doing this work of God and none of it involved obeying Pharaoh. So, where does that leave us in terms of our faithfulness? Because God often has circuitous paths to accomplish his will. And very specific jobs that we might rely, be relied upon to do, very specific things to enact God's will and God's ways. And it requires us to see him as Peter did, as the Messiah. And so when we are able to see Jesus as Messiah, to discover our place in God's will, God's ways, and God's plan, so that we do our part, we might wind up finding ourselves part of a story not unlike the story of the people of Israel ultimately moving out of Pharaoh's clutches and not unlike the story of Moses and Moses' mother and sister and all of these little things that went together to eventually get to that point where Moses would say let my people go. And so God's will was being fulfilled. So there's a richness to these stories and a way to let them touch our own imaginations for how God might be calling you and God might be calling me to do our work, not obeying Pharaoh or anyone else who might be telling us what is it God's will to do, but rather hearing God's call, doing God's will, and maybe being part of a story much larger than we could ask for or imagine. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of me, of one being with the Father, through him all things to me, for us. 
pray for healing, guidance, or strength for Dorothy Batson, Ivy Martin, Fred Keene, Gina Norris, Dolores Thomas, Mac Alexander, Margie Jefferson, Ruby Lockhart, Eleanor Solomon, Stella Jacob, Ernest Reese, Rich Grinnell, Doug Warren, Deborah Blanchett, and Kristen Scotland Stanley. on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 
The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing.
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us out of the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and sinfulness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Good morning, my church family. These are our announcements for today. First of all, we are so happy to hear, have our fearless leader back with us. He had a wonderful vacation out in one of my favorite cities, San Francisco, and other parts of the West. These are our announcements for today. On Sunday, September 10th, we will celebrate UBE Sunday and the Feast of Alexander Crummel. The Union of Black Episcopalians celebrate the life and legacy of our notable saint, the Reverend Alexander Crummel, on his official feast day. Crummel was the personification of the will to overcome during the 19th century successfully confronting and prevailing over barriers erected because of his race. According to a great cloud of witnesses, Crummel's ministry spanned more than half a century and three continents. Everywhere, at all times, he labored to prepare black people and to build institutions that would serve them and provide scope for the exercise of their gifts in leadership and creativity. His faith in God, his perseverance, in spite of repeated discouragement, his perception that the church transcended the racism and limited vision of its leaders, and his unfailing belief in the goodness and greatness of black people are the legacy of this African-American pioneer. He died in Red Bank, New Jersey in 1898. UBE designates Sunday, September 10th, as UBE Sunday to commemorate the racial justice ministry of the Union, which was an outgrowth of Father Crummel's advocacy. So please make sure you are here to join us in this momentous Sunday for UBE. We apparently have a storm approaching our state. And as such, we advise all of you to make sure that you are prepared. Deirdre Joseph has graciously supplied a disaster supply kit checklist that you may pick up as you leave today in case you need some reminders about all of the things that you will need just in case. We would like to, again, wish a happy birthday to Shamara Marbury and Marvin Martin and a happy anniversary to Julius and Navita James. <laughs> These are our announcements today. Father Ed, okay. anything to add? Only to say again, it's good to be back. We went uh, out to uh, California where my daughter's in-laws are and we spent time with them. Then we hunted down, then my sister joined us, we hunted down her birthplace and visited the house where she lived as, up till the age of two. I really wanted to visit the San Andreas Fault, which I got a chance to do, and hike the thing called the Earthquake Trail, uh, which is right there, right where they would live. And then, uh, um, then my sister and I took the train to Chicago which is just, it's wonderful to see, see the whole, whole 
bunch of the U.S. aid, and then I made my way eventually back home from there. So, hitchhike, not quite. I did take an airplane finally, but it was good. So I appreciate that. Uh, with the storm warning, one of the things we do do is check on each other. I don't need to tell you to do that. You all do that. So uh, we, we must do that. Uh, it's a, a time when one might fall in need. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll see. We've had such a disastrous storm hit south of us uh, not too long ago. And so we're still, that area is still uh, in the midst of recovery. So, um, okay. Any other announcements? Don't think so. I know we have a feast today uh, following the service. Let us sing.